August 15, 1936, during a mass celebrated by Father Andres, a moment before the elevation, God's presence pervaded my soul, which was drawn to the altar. Then I saw the Mother of God with the Infant Jesus. The Infant Jesus was holding on to the hands of Our Lady. A moment later, the Infant Jesus ran with joy to the center of the altar, and the Mother of God said to me, See with what assurance I entrust Jesus into his hands. In the same way, you are to entrust your soul and be like a child to him. After these words, my soul was filled with unusual trust. The Mother of God was clothed in a white dress, strangely white, transparent. On her shoulders, she had a transparent blue, that is, a blue-like mantle, with uncovered head and flowing hair. She was exquisite and inconceivably beautiful. She was looking at Father with great tenderness, but after a moment, he broke up this beautiful child, and living blood flowed forth. Father bent forward and received the true and living Jesus into himself. Had he eaten him? I do not know how this took place. Jesus, Jesus, I cannot keep up with you, for in an instant you become incomprehensible to me. The essence of the virtues is the will of God. He who does the will of God faithfully practices all the virtues. In all the events and circumstances of my life, I adore and bless the holy will of God. The holy will of God is the object of my love. In the most secret depths of my soul, I live according to his will. I act exteriorly according to what I recognize inwardly as the will of God. Sweeter to me are the torments, sufferings, persecutions, and all manner of adversities by divine will than popularity, praise, and esteem by my own will. Good night, my Jesus. The bell is calling me to sleep. My Jesus, you see that I am dying from the desire to save souls. Good night, my beloved. I rejoice at being one day closer to eternity. And if you let me wake up tomorrow, Jesus, I shall begin a new hymn to your praise. July 13th. During meditation today, I came to understand that I should never speak about my own interior experiences, but that I should conceal nothing from my spiritual director. And I will especially ask God to enlighten my spiritual director. I attach greater importance to the words of my confessor than to all the lights taken together that I receive interiorly. Amid the greatest torments, I fix the gaze of my soul upon Jesus crucified. I do not expect help from people, but place my trust in God. In his unfathomable mercy lies all my hope. The more I feel that God is transforming me, the more I desire to immerse myself in silence. The love of God is doing its work in the depths of my soul. I see that the mission which the Lord has entrusted to me is beginning. Once, when I was praying fervently to the Jesuit saints, I suddenly saw my guardian angel who led me before the throne of God. I passed through great hosts of saints, and I recognized many of them, whom I knew from their pictures. I saw many Jesuits who asked me from what congregation I was. When I answered, they asked, Who is your spiritual director? I answered that it was Father Andres. When they wanted to say more, my guardian angel beckoned me to be silent, and I came before the throne of God. I saw a great and inaccessible light, and I saw a place destined for me, close to God. But what it was like, I do not know, because a cloud covered it. However, my guardian angel said to me, Here is your throne, for your faithfulness in fulfilling the will of God. Holy Hour, Thursday. During this hour of prayer, Jesus allowed me to enter the canticle, and I was a witness to what happened there. However, I was most deeply moved when before the consecration, Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and entered into a mysterious conversation with his Father. It is only in eternity that we shall really understand that moment. His eyes were like two flames, his face was radiant, white as snow, his whole personage full of majesty, his soul full of longing. At the moment of consecration, love rested, satiated, the sacrifice fully consummated. Now only the external ceremony of death will be carried out. External destruction, the essence of it, is in the canical. Never in my whole life had I understood this mystery so profoundly as during that hour of adoration. 
Oh, how ardently I desire that the whole world would come to know this unfathomable mercy. After the holy hour when I went to my cell, I suddenly learned how greatly God was offended by a certain person who was close to my heart. At the sight of this, my soul was pierced with pain, and I cast myself in the dust before the Lord, begging his mercy. For two hours in tears, prayer, and flagellation, I prevented the sin, and I learned that God's mercy had embraced that poor soul. Oh, the price of one single sin. September, first Friday. In the evening, I saw the mother of God with her breast bared and pierced with a sword. She was shedding bitter tears and shielding us against God's terrible punishment. God wants to inflict terrible punishment on us, but he cannot because the mother of God is shielding us. Horrible fear seized my soul. I kept praying incessantly for Poland, for my dear Poland, which is so lacking in gratitude for the mother of God. If it were not for the mother of God, all our efforts would be of little use. I intensified my prayers and sacrifices for a dear native land, but I see that I am a drop before the wave of evil. How can a drop stop a wave? Oh yes, a drop is nothing of itself. But with you, Jesus, I shall stand up bravely to the whole wave of evil and even to the whole of hell. Your omnipotence can do all things. Once, as I was going down to the hall to the kitchen, I heard these words in my soul. Say unceasingly the chaplet that I have thought you. Whoever will recite it will receive great mercy at the hour of death. Priests will recommend it to sinners as their last hope of salvation. Even if there were a sinner most hardened, if he were to recite this chaplet only once, he would receive grace from my infinite mercy. I desire that the whole world know my infinite mercy. I desire to grant unimaginable graces to these souls who trust in my mercy. Jesus, life and truth, my master, guide every step of my life that I may act according to your holy will. On one occasion, I saw the throne of the Lamb of God and before the throne three saints, Stanislaw Kuska, Andrew Bola, and Prince Casimir, who were interceding for Poland. All at once, I saw a large book which stands before the throne and it was given to me to read. The book was written in blood. Still, I could not read anything but the name of Jesus. Then I heard a voice which said to me, Your hour has not yet come. Then the book was taken away from me, and I heard these words, You will bear witness to my infinite mercy. In this book are written the names of the souls that have glorified my mercy. I was overwhelmed with joy at the sight of such great goodness of God. On one occasion, I came to know of the condition of two religious sisters who were grumbling interiorly about an order the superior had given them, and for this reason God had withheld many special graces from them. My heart ached at this sight. How sad it is, O Jesus, when we ourselves are the cause of the loss of graces. Whoever understands this is always faithful. Thursday. Although I was very tired today, I nevertheless resolved to make a holy hour. I could not pray, nor could I remain kneeling, but I remained in prayer for a whole hour and united myself in spirit with those souls who are already worshipping God in the perfect way. But toward the end of the hour, I suddenly saw Jesus, who looked at me penetratingly and said with ineffable sweetness, Your prayer is extremely pleasing to me. After these words, an unusual power and spiritual joy entered my soul. God's presence continued to pervade my soul. Oh, what happens to a soul that meets the Lord face to face? No pen has ever expressed or ever will. Oh, Jesus, I understand that your mercy is beyond all imagining, and therefore I ask you to make my heart so big that there will be room in it for the needs of all the souls living on the face of the earth. Oh, Jesus, my love extends beyond the world to the souls suffering in purgatory and I want to exercise mercy toward them by means of indulgenced prayers. God's mercy is unfathomable and inexhaustible, just as God himself is unfathomable. Even if I were to use the strongest words there are to express this mercy of God, all this would be nothing in comparison with what it is in reality. O oh, Jesus, make my heart sensitive to all the sufferings of my neighbor, whether of body or of soul. O oh, my Jesus, I know that you act toward us as we act toward our neighbor. 
My Jesus, make my heart like unto your merciful heart. Jesus, help me to go through life doing good to everyone. September 14, 1936 The Archbishop Joe Wysikowski of Vilnius visited us. Although he stayed with us for a very short time, I still had a chance to talk with this worthy priest about the work of mercy. He showed himself very favorably disposed of this cause of mercy. Sister, be completely at peace. If this is within the plans of divine providence, it will come about. In the meantime, sister, pray for a clear outward sign. Let the Lord Jesus give you a clearer knowledge of this. I beg you to wait a little while longer. The Lord Jesus will arrange the circumstances in such a way that everything will turn out all right. September 19th, 1936 when we left the doctor's office and stepped into the sanatorium chapel for a moment, I heard these words in my soul. My child, just a few more drops in your chalice, it won't be long now. Joy filled my soul. This was the first call from my beloved spouse and master. My heart melted, and there was a moment when my soul was immersed in the whole sea of God's mercy. I felt that my mission was beginning in all its fullness. Death destroys nothing that is good. Pray most of all for souls that are experiencing inner sufferings. Once I received light concerning two sisters, I understood that it is not possible for a person to act in the same manner towards everyone. There are some people who have a strange way of making friends with others, and then as friends and under the pretext of that friendship, they manage to draw the person out word by word. Then when the right moment comes, they use those very same words to hurt that person. My Jesus, how strange is human frailty. Your love, Jesus, gives the soul this great prudence in its dealing with others. September 24th, 1936. Mother Superior Irene ordered me to say one decade of the rosary in place of all the other exercises and to go to bed at once. As soon as I laid down, I fell asleep, for I was very tired. But a while later, I was awakened by suffering. It was such a great suffering that it prevented me from making even the slightest movement. I could not even swallow my saliva. This lasted for about three hours. I thought of waking up the novice sister who shared my room, but then I thought, she cannot give me any help, so let her sleep. It would be a pity to wake her. I resigned myself completely to the will of God and thought that the day of my death so much desired had come. It was an occasion for me to unite myself with Jesus suffering on the cross. Beyond that, I was unable to pray. When the suffering ceased, I began to perspire, but I still could not move, as the pain would return at each attempt. In the morning, I felt very tired, though I felt no further physical pain. Still, I could not get up to attend Mass. I thought to myself, if after such suffering death does not come, then how great the sufferings of death must be. Jesus, you know that I love suffering and want to drain the cup of suffering to the last drop. And yet my nature experienced a slight shudder and fear. Quickly, however, my trust in the infinite mercy of God was awakened in all its force and everything else had to give away before it, like a shadow retreating before the sun's rays. Oh Jesus, how great is your goodness. Your infinite goodness, so well known to me, enables me to bravely look death itself in the eye. I know that nothing will happen to me without God's permission. I desire to glorify your infinite mercy during my life, at the hour of death, in a resurrection, and throughout eternity. I count on nothing in my whole life, but only on your infinite mercy. It is the guiding thread of my life, O Lord. My soul is filled with God's mercy. Oh, how sorely Jesus is hurt by the ingratitude of a chosen soul. What a martyrdom it is for his unspeakable love. God loves us with the entire infinite being that he is. And imagine a miserable particle of dust scorns that love. My heart bursts with pain when I see this ingratitude.